Hello, good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us for this masterclass on digital innovation and productivity. We're glad so many of you can join us today. We've got a, a packed program. I'm Joe Scott, and I'm delighted to be your host for today. This is, of course, one of four webinars in our COVID Recovery Kickstart program. And I know Carolyn's going to expand on that in just a moment for you. I think as we continue to emerge from COVID, exploiting digital and embracing innovation feels more important than ever. So whether you're well advanced on that journey or whether you're simply wondering where to start, hopefully there's something for everyone today. As you look for ways to maybe operate more efficiently, develop new products or exploit new markets and opportunities. And I should say, if the mere mention of the word digital sends shivers up your spine, well, hopefully our contributors today will put your mind at rest a little bit and let you know that you don't need to be a tech expert to get started and reap rewards. So first up, let me hand over to Carolyn Boyd, Industry Development Manager for Tourism NI. Carolyn. Thanks, Joe. And uh, obviously, we're delighted that you can host our series. So thank you very much. Um, Good afternoon and welcome to everybody. Um, as Joe said, this is the first of our webinar, our masterclass series. Um, and today we're covering digital innovation. So hopefully you're in the right place and uh, into the right webinar. Um, for in this series, and these are actually mirroring the Kickstart funding. So this is to support us in Kickstart and the um, topics today, digital. We're then moving on next week to talk about sustainability, a bit of a hot topic at the moment. Um, and then we're talking about the skills and uh, people agenda. And we're finishing up the series with a, talking about processing, um, pricing, and how to streamline your business. Um, the Kickstart program is still open at the moment, folks. It's been extended to the 19th of um, November. Um, and it's about aligning up skills and expertise to help you get with action plans. Um, so if you are eligible, great. If you're not, you can obviously still um, engage with us and have a chat with us. Um, I'm very, very excited about today because I was at the rehearsal and it's very good when you're at a rehearsal and you get so excited. Um, and I think you're all going to be very wowed by, by today. Some of our speakers are not in Northern Ireland, um, which is interesting. Um, and uh, hopefully the technology will hold up today. Um, so please, please just relax and enjoy but also keep an eye out for hints and tips and anything that you can do in your own business. And also please um, keep up to date at tni.com, tourismni.com, where you can onboard and get all the alerts about um, our calendar of events. Um, and you'll get in, you know, invitations out to your inbox as well. So again, relax and thanks again, Joe, um, and hopefully everybody enjoys themselves. Brilliant. Thank you, Carolyn. And I should say that today's webinar will be recorded. You can uh, pick up on that on uh, TNI.com as well. Um, and we'll make time for questions and answers at the end of the session, too. So first up, Mary McKeown is our first contributor today. Mary is Tourism Manager for Mid-Ulster District Council. She's got more than 20 years experience in developing tourism projects in Mid-Ulster. And Mary and her team have put that knowledge and all that expertise to good use by developing a completely new tourist attraction in Daba Forest. I think it's a great example of what we're talking about today. So Mary, tell us a bit more. Thank you, Joe. I'm just checking everybody can see the presentation on the screen. Yep, looking good. That's great. Well, many thanks for the opportunity to speak with you all today. As Joe has already said, my name is Mary McKeown and I'm the Tourism Manager. And I'm going to speak to you today about innovation around the Stars and Stone experience, which is one of Tourism Northern Ireland signature brand experience for Embrace the Giant Spirit. And I like to call it a luxury getaway in unspoilt Spurn Mountains. Now, the Stars and Stone experience incorporates Om Dark Sky Park and Observatory, which is located in Dava Forest in an area of outstanding natural beauty in the Spurn Mountains. This is one of Northern Ireland's new attractions, which we launched in the summer of 2021. Now, the centre is only 80 minutes from Belfast, two hours from Dublin, roughly 50 minutes from Derry, and an hour and 20 minutes from Donegal and the Wild Atlantic Way. Dava in Irish translates into cauldron, and this is how this area is protected from light pollution. 
Omdar Sky Park and Observatory is Northern Ireland's first dark sky park. The park is the 78th in the world and the 77th is the Grand Canyon. Now, 80% of people live under sky glow. And what I mean by that is you can't see the stars or the planets above you. So this park is a true star party in the sky. The image on the screen shows what light pollution is. As you can see in the inner cities like Belfast and Dublin, you really can't see stars. But in the dark sky park, you will see our stars, our planets and our constellations at its best. The observatory building itself isn't really that large. And to create the sense of space travel and planet hopping, digital technology has brought this to life. This is what we created for OM, working in partnership with Tandem Design and NoHo. The VR headset, which you can see in the picture, creates space. You can land on the moon, take a journey through our solar system, or step inside the International Space Station without ever leaving the comfort of the observatory. The most important piece of technology you can see is our LX600 MEAD Go To Telescope. Once the automatic roof opens, you can program the telescope to go to any star in the sky. As only one person can look through a telescope at any time, digital technology allows the images to be shown on the large screens throughout the building. Technology also allows us to link up with other telescopes around the world, creating an immersive experience every time. Now, this is where the magic begins. We launched this on the 27th of October, and this is our OM Odyssey outdoor film experience. And as you can hear from me, I am really excited about this one. And um, when we brought the guys over from London, they said, we have never put a projection show in a forest before. And um, the guys have come from London and they said, let's see how this goes. And they are truly excited about it. And we are currently um, making more films with them. We've got a lovely Christmas projection show coming. And then we have a new one coming from, auto, from in the autumn 2020. But the screen and images that you can see that I'm showing is actually our solar system experience. And also we link it with our heritage because in OM, this is where archaeology meets astronomy. As you can see in this picture, we encourage people to bring your own telescopes and your binoculars. You know, and you don't have to buy a big expensive pair of binoculars or telescopes. And our staff can help you how to use them and explain what you're looking at in the sky. Now, these guys, it was taken maybe last winter um, and they, we were looking at the moons around Jupiter. And the first time you see that, folks, it is truly amazing. And you realise we are very small, but digital technology can make everything come to life. And a small space seem very big. Now, finally, we launched our own solar search experience on the 27th of October as well. Now, our own, our own solar search lets you explore the planets of the solar system along a wonderful forest trail located at the observatory. As you wander along the trail, markers with QR codes let you trigger amazing AR experience of the planets on your phone. Learn, learning facts like how old the Earth is, what the Saturn rings are made of. Beginning at the observatory building, the further you walk along the trail, the further you will travel into the galaxy. It starts with the sun and finishes with Neptune. But with AR technology, it's not often that you see Venus appear in the middle of a forest. Finally, at the end of the trail, you will reach at the spectacular prehistoric monument called Beckmore Stone Circles. And I like to call this our first observatory. No one knows for sure why the Neolithic ancestors built them but it's thought that the stone circles might be aligned to some galactic pattern in the night sky. A breathtaking 3D experience can tell you more how the landscape surrounding the monuments has been evolved over time. But thank you, Joe. I'm going to stop sharing um, and you can ask me any questions. I think it looks amazing. I feel like I'm there. A, a party in the sky, nothing, nothing better. And we could all do with a luxury getaway too at the minute, couldn't we? Um, let me just ask you this. I mean, we, we touched on it at the start about people being nervous or slightly apprehensive about embracing digital tech. You didn't seem to let that put you off. I mean, this was entirely new territory to you, Mary, wasn't it? It was, Joe. And I am certainly not a digital um, technician. I don't have any of that background. But what I'm good at is traveling and I'm good at looking and seeing and replicating and trying to do it a bit better. And uh, it was a, a it was a visit that I had firstly over to Galloway in Scotland and, and that was one of the very first dark sky parks 
and it was lovely, but they just had static interpretation pla uh, panels and it wasn't very interesting or engaging. And I thought, well, where as dark as that in DAVA? And then we started a process to get our, our dark sky accreditation. Then when I traveled to other observatories, um, and, and the one that I went to was the Griffin Observatory in, in Los Angeles, and a beautiful old observatory. But once again, static interpretation, and nobody was allowed to touch the large telescope. There wasn't that opportunity for engagement. It was a really exciting tour, but I just thought we could make this better. Um, and with budget constraints too, you know, you have to be realistic what you can achieve. So with OM then, that's when we started the journey. And AR and VR, I just love it. It's fantastic. You know, in Los Angeles, what I saw also was you were in a shopping mall. But one minute I was in the shopping mall, and the next minute I was walking with the dinosaurs. So it's it's all of that. It's making that small space large, and it can be you can go anywhere. It's a game changer, isn't it? It certainly is, and and do you enjoy it and embrace it? And honestly, I honestly think consumers are expecting more because they want to see something that they can't get in the comfort of their own home. Well, I'm sure it wasn't without its challenges. I mean, you're you're in a fairly remote part of the world. There, can you tell us a bit about some of those digital challenges specifically? Of course. So the digital challenge, the, the the technology and the, the broadband was the major one. Um, and we just had to get our head around that. And, and we did have to use a bit of our investment to get connectivity up to the area. There's a really good uh, Brockdor community group. They work with us too. And I think it is key, especially with, with, with council government, to work with the community um, mm -hmm. and bringing these ideas to fruition. And then, you know, especially now, whenever you do the solar walk, because it's 3.6 kilometres, you're walking right into an area where you don't even have phone signal. But the, yeah. GB, the, uh, the GPS technology allows you to download the app in the observatory and then you still get that full immersive experience along the journey. There's always ways around things, isn't there? There certainly is. So, I mean, you know, you only opened, what, a matter of weeks ago, 23rd of October, something like that? And, you, oh, and, sorry, Joe, and if the truth be told, we tried to open this April 2019 and that's just whenever, as everybody knows, we went into lockdown. Yeah and, yeah, and and it was. Do you know what? In reflection, actually, it was a nice pause. Um, and we looked at we looked at our technologies, and we actually improved our technologies. And we got doing a lot of pilot runs, um, with the staff and with the community, so that whenever we did welcome our first international visitors on the 29th of October, that mm. we knew that 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 it would be that everybody would be satisfied. So COVID gave you that breathing space, that time to reset. It did, and. I feel per people now have embraced digital technology because normally, Joe, you and I would be doing this in Belfast um, yeah. in, front of, in front of a group of people. Um, and now everybody's not afraid to download applications to their phones and, and certainly QR codes. You know, back in 2011, 13, the QR codes was, you know, and then nobody used them. And now QR, QR codes are everywhere again. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's had its pluses and its negatives. So big opportunities for the future then? Yeah, as I say, we don't never stop. We're going into phase four now in the, in the forest park up in Dava. We've got a, a large uh, giant sculpture and there's three sculptures going within the Spurn Mountains. So we'll link up one in Dere and Straban and one down in Fermanagh and Oma. And then of course one in uh, Mid Ulster. And uh, we call ours our, our stargazer. And what we're doing with this large giant is with digital technology and AR, the giant will come alive and uh, he'll be able to talk to you. So it's something exciting. No, you just you have to keep refreshing it. And it's as, it's, as, it's as cheap to refresh a video than it is interpretation. Brilliant. I'm tempted to say the sky's the limit, but that would be a bit cheesy, <laughs> wouldn't it? Be? It's OK, Joe. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for all your uh, information today. Really helpful. And good Thank luck you. with it. Thank you. OK, so moving on from Mary now, our, uh, our next contributor is Nick Hall. Nick's joining us from uh, Seville today, so a good test of technology. Um, he's the CEO and founder of the Digital Tourism Think Tank. Nick is widely considered as one of the world's leading experts on digital trends and transformation in the field of tourism. Uh, with 20 years experience, there's hardly a DMO that Nick hasn't advised, and he's been personally behind change for so many DMOs and continues to drive the, cons the conversation around industry trends today. So we are delighted that he's been able to join us. Over to you, Nick.
Uh, hello, well, great to yeah. be joining you. And can you hear me okay? We can hear you fine, yeah. I'm not sure, can we see Perfect. you? Okay. Can you see me? Let me just uh, get the camera on. There we go. Now you can see me. So great to see everybody. And uh, thank you very much for having me as part of this webinar today. Um, well, I did a lot of thinking before preparing this because I'm sure you're all suffering from Zoom fatigue, um, in this case, uh, other platforms. So you need something a little bit colorful to spark your interest and keep it alive. And of course, uh, most of you will have spent the last 18 months uh, doing a lot of learning, thinking, observing, considering, and working really on how you can improve your business for this golden moment when you were able to reopen. But digital has defined so much of the last 18 months. Many people are referring to this period as forced digitalization. Uh, process of change that not all of us were exactly enthusiastic to embrace, but we've all had to. And I thought for today, I will take you through digital almost like a, a journey through life and um, try to give you some different perspectives on digital, which um, perhaps give you some ideas that you can incorporate into your business. So I'm calling this four steps to digital success. And I certainly look forward to any questions you have at the end. So getting started. Well, first of all, why do we even do what we do online? Why do we have to be online? Well, of course, you might jump straight to we need to sell online. We need our customers, our guests to be able to book experiences and book their stays with us online. But before we get to that point, what's more important is to be able to tell your story online. And in today's social world, we are all familiar with how quickly we skim through social media, we scroll with our thumbs, and getting thumb-stopping content is harder and harder. And a couple of years ago, a lot of research pointed to the average audience uh, attention span being around eight seconds. So eight seconds doesn't give you a great deal of opportunity to catch people's attention. But I thought I would start with that because whenever I work with small businesses and we talk about digitalization, it's such a word we use at a kind of corporate level, for most businesses, and we talk about what does digitalization mean to you, the answer is social, maybe it's even just Instagram or Facebook. So I thought, let's start with that, and then we can build it up from there. So here's what you can do with social for your brand in 60 seconds, even if your audience only have eight. And Nick, hopefully this quick... Yes. Sorry, just, just Absolutely. Timely time, a timely time to say that we're not seeing your slide. Ah. Okay, that was quite timely. Thanks a lot. <laughs> uh, let me see. I will just, it does say it's sharing, but let me stop it and start it again. Can you see them now? No, no, uh, we did this so. Uh, only seeing a white screen, Nick. Do you want me to, to run the PDF from my side and just tell me when you want to move on? Um, let me see if this is working. Is that working for you? Oh, we're seeing the left hand side now, so we are. Yeah, we're seeing it outside of presentation mode. There okay, so it should be good now. Yeah. Okay, strange, but we're back. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, thank you. you missed the bright yellow slide. Um, so, thank you for pointing that out. So, telling your story. Here's what social can do for your brand in 60 seconds, even if your audience only has eight seconds. And thankfully, you flagged that up straight away, so we haven't missed anything. Well, first of all, why do we use social at all? It's about creating a connection with our audience, a connection which is human, which is inherently social, and which is engaging. And what's at the, what's at the heart of this is obviously real experiences. We've heard a lot about influencers um, over the last few years, and many of us will think influencers is about reaching a huge new audience and a marketing channel in itself. But over the last few years, we've seen a shift towards micro-influencers, locals or very specific subject matter uh, influencers who can really tell a story in a way which is convincing and authentic for their audience. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a huge audience. The value that they have for their audience is very significant and they can convey a much more authentic and convincing message than perhaps you can of your own brand. This is an example of the Food Guide London, just one of many micro-influencers with I think around 12,000 followers, so not huge. 
And um, luckily for you, the audio is off because there is quite a bit of swearing in this. But it's a good example of how real and raw content can get when it's told through the eyes of others who have uh, a certain command with their audience. And this might be TikTok, especially if you're not on that channel. Uh, it could also be Reels. It could also be creating content in a style or a format that is just not something that perhaps you yourself are comfortable with. If we look at a brand level, this is an example of Noma, the very famous Michelin star restaurant in Copenhagen. Noma has won a lot of awards and is uh, widely considered one of the best restaurants in the world. But what makes Noma so unique and special is that they source all of their ingredients locally. They use often some very unusual local ingredients that we perhaps overlook in their food. And what they've done here is they've used social to be able to show the very raw and the very beautiful aspects of the produce that sits behind that amazing food they produce. And as you can see in the top video, it's very dirty, uh, almost sensual um, way of feeling and touching uh, those berries. And in the bottom, it's very beautiful, this more classical Instagram style of putting content out. And what this tells us is that there is no right or wrong approach to how you tell your story online. It's really about what can work for your audience, what can trigger engagement, and how you can be creative in how you do that. During the lockdown especially, we saw a lot of uh, a rise in kind of learning with uh, content where uh, different creators, uh, here's a great example of Waste Free Planet, show tips and tricks and explainers about how you can put to play certain pro hacks and do really cool things at home. But this is a great opportunity for both businesses to bring in those kind of content creators into their business, but also it's a brilliant opportunity for you to look at your business itself and think actually what little pro hacks can we teach our users and can we share with people? Because ultimately, if you can create the right content here, this is highly engaging and highly shareable content. Another big trend, especially coming from this with me movement where we learn along with other people. I think sourdough bread was one of the most trending topics on YouTube uh, during the lockdown. Is this idea that we're all creators and we're a generation of social creators and crafters. Well, this is a great example of um, a business in Utah that uh, decided to start showing the process behind the artisan element of their business as a way to survive lockdowns. But it's something that really caught on and it created a lot of engagement and interest around the brand. Ultimately, this is about sharing the love for what you do with your followers online and finding really creative ways to use video and to use social to be able to do that in a sharp, snappy and inspiring way. And this is one of my favorite uh, type of videos. We've got a whole collection of uh, lunch and food videos, but food videos are really, really, um, can be really powerful and tantalizing in particular when you take people through a kind of step-by-step -step tutorial approach with very fast cut video. Now, there are obviously some skills here, but there are many great ways to learn how to do these kind of things on your mobile phones yourself. And it doesn't require any special equipment. So a bit of time invested in trying to understand how to do this can allow you to create really interesting perspectives on what you do. And obviously this is a delicious looking recipe and it's a really great example of content that you yourself have probably engaged with, shared, commented on, or even downloaded or stopped and tried to actually make those quick and fast dishes yourself. This is an example of Poppy Cooks, um, which is a young chef, very influential on social media. And uh, it's just a great example of what is an explosion of young chefs showing how to do brilliant things because let's face it, most of us can't really do this incredible dishes at home. There's so many opportunities to find collaborations outside of your business, but also to find collaborations within the business. For example, working with the chef to see what kind of, uh, what kind of content you could create and how you can make that engaging. But whilst a lot of the content I've shown so far is very raw, very real, very, um, well, very social, frankly, there is also space for being so-called on brand understanding what is the core essence of your brand. For example, if you're a luxury brand like Air France, how do you convey and tell your story? And how do you do that consistently? This is ultimately what's key to being a very strong and consistent brand online is that you understand 
the tone of voice in how you tell your story. You understand the elements which make it up. And in this case, Air France is reinforcing its brand identity, which, and I quote them directly, uh, they say, as the flag bearer of France, they symbolize France. And for their overseas markets, in, partic in particular, the global markets, conveying an almost romantic image of French fashion and design is absolutely quintessential to the brand. And they're consistent in that. So we don't always have to go raw and sort of uh, off the cuff. Here's another great example of how valuable it is to co-create. This is a uh, restaurant, a burger restaurant in uh, Copenhagen. They collaborate together with both their customers and other producers. They offer their customers a free combo meal if they share their story and they decide to repost it. Something very straightforward and very simple, but of course, highly effective and engaging. It's a great way to think about the little things you can do to get your customers to engage and share the story around your business. But they also build alliances. So they have a different beer partnership every single month where they tell a story together, they produce content together, and they pair a burger with a beer. Something as simple as that every business can think of and think, actually, this is such a great opportunity to establish a collaboration. Well, often we try to put tourism in a box. We talk about the tourism industry, we do things for the tourism industry, we talk about tourism arrival numbers and overnights, but the reality is that so many of us have learned how important that local and that hyper-local market is, and we've learned the value of the wider visitor economy. So if we take tourism out of the box, we can also imagine a broader set of opportunities when we think about partnerships. This is a great example. We're based in Canterbury in the southeast of England, by the way. And this is a business, uh, Simpsons. It's a vineyard, a uh, very well-established wine estate. And they teamed up with Noble Isle, which make a range of uh, very quintessentially English cosmetics. And they found a really good brand match in the way that uh, I showed with Air France and a really good example of collaboration as I did with the beer there. And they produced a product together. So this is just some ideas about how you can leverage social, build on your story and capture attention in that extremely short attention span that your social users have. And that's probably a great place to get started with your ideas. But going further, well, it's a bit like starting a relationship. Swipe right, you've made a connection. Pass 60 seconds on social and anything goes. And this is now the time when we move into long form content and we think about how to take that relationship with your customer, that so-called engagement metric to the next level. Maybe you can even hold on to them for more than 30 minutes and build a real relationship which lasts over time. And the reason this is important is because whilst attention spans have got shorter and shorter over the years, social and mobile has dominated our lifestyles, Long form content, on the other hand, has also got more and more important. We're all familiar that we spend a lot more time watching on-demand content. Today, generations even grow up watching content only on YouTube, something I still can't get my head around. But we know that the way we consume media and the way we watch and entertain ourselves has changed dramatically. And that gives a lot more potential for us to be part of that space in an affordable way because let's face it, disruptive media and uh, has taken over from traditional media. Well, if we look at different ideas which might come into play, I thought for Joe, I will include something from BBC here. One of my favorite examples is um, something which I think is quite experimental, but really interesting just to spark ideas. And this is uh, this Soundscapes project, Scout Soundscapes for Wellbeing. I really love this because it shows the different ways in which we can play with content and audio, visual and sound content. If it's sparked your curiosity, just Google it. And um, they created a radiophonic travel agency which allows you to be taken away and escape to different places where you have the sounds, for example, of the English Channel and swimming across it accompanied by images. But it's just a great example of how we can completely change how we interact with content thanks to the ability to bring things together digitally. I'm going to hit play. This is the only video with sound because I know it doesn't always come across well. Um, but you may hear uh, the sound of, well, I don't know what it is, but this is ASMR, a really, really big trend right now and something that most brands can quickly figure out how to play with that. 
think about all of the cells that exist in and around your business, the experience, perhaps, for example, as we heard earlier, it might be the sound of the night still. Um, and think about how you can bring that together through uh, very, very rich audio content, perhaps accompanied with video, but perhaps not. Well, you might not necessarily be able to directly measure the conversion from that. But what it does is allows you to build a strong relationship and engagement with your potential customers. It invites them to get to know what you're about and to explore it at a very deep level, which of course is all part of building interest and awareness. There are so many other opportunities, such as serialized content, which allows you to build perspective, creating a series of videos. In this case, um, with the Met in the US, they created a series called Met Stories, which tell the stories of their guests and their visitors through their perspectives. And this is a story about how we came through COVID, for example, and how we're pivoting to be more sustainable. There are so many different ways in which you can find um, angles and stories which you might want to tell over a series of videos. It might be about the process behind your business or spotlighting producers who are part of the experience you create. It might even be a series, for example, uh, about what we just heard about, how we built an, um, a, a digital telescope experience. And this is a really great example of how you can use content to tell the backstory behind the business. Podcasts are also such a rich medium to build a relationship with your guests. And it's also a great opportunity to build and retain loyalty with customers. If somebody comes through your door and they really like you, the, the servers or the people they meet, or the artists behind perhaps some of the artwork that's on display, well, maybe there's a series there that you can tell uh, and you can retain that interest. It's about not wanting a customer to go through the door and leave the door and never connect again. Think of it like an audio newsletter. Think of it as an opportunity to keep a relationship alive long after that visit has gone through the door. This is an example of uh, Visit Philadelphia. They created a series also last year called Love and Grit, and it was in response uh, to some of, the, um, some of the events that happened in the US last year, in particular the wake of the murder of George Floyd, where they wanted to show support for the black community in Philadelphia. And they decided to create, alongside a lot of other initiatives, this podcast to talk about the story of Philadelphia's highly diverse community that makes up a really interesting, diverse and dynamic city. And this is about being a relevant voice. And for a tourist board, this is about transitioning from being a brand that puts out a voice that's perhaps not always authentic. It's very slick, it's very produced, but it doesn't tell a real story to connecting on a much more genuine level through the medium of radio. But in this uh, form, we are obviously looking at a podcast. And there's so many opportunities to start to look at the opportunity for hybrid experiences. This is the potential to augment those real experiences. Content, digital and geolocated content can transition those audiences that you build a relationship with online, whether that's that eight second spark on social, or whether that's that serialized visitor that's following everything you do, to creating in-person or IRL, in real life experiences, where you can bridge that content in the context of the place they're visiting. This is a great example of an app called Smartify. It was designed um, as part of, uh, or in partnership with the Europeana Foundation, which is a digitalized archive collection of all the artwork throughout Europe. And they decided to create an AR tool, which allows you to scan artwork and actually learn more about it. So, for example, you can go into a museum or a gallery, you can use your phone, scan the artwork and understand more behind it. But they also allow you to bring artwork outside of the gallery, outside of the museum and put it in the context of any environment. And it's a great example of how you can work with tools like this to build new experiences. And important to say for the small businesses, also think about creative ways to use existing tools to build them into the experiences that you're creating. You don't always need to find the funds to create your own app or AR experience. You can also think about creative ways to work with existing ones, but build an experience on top of what you already offer. So now, if we go a little bit further and a little bit deeper, things are getting real. 
So we've spent the last 18 months locked up online. And of course, this has changed us fundamentally. We talk now about digital, virtual, remote, and hybrid experiences. And of course, these are buzzwords, but they are also real trends. And the big question that most of us are asking, in particular now, as the numbers are not going in the right direction, is, is the, panic, is the pandemic over yet? Many of us have been hoping that we can just return to normal, but the reality is that there is no returning to normal. The post-pandemic consumer behaves differently, searches for something different, engages differently, and actually lives differently. And anybody who saw the announcements from Airbnb yesterday will see that they can see this in their data and they are really responding to a very different way in which we live and work. And for example, they've seen a huge rise in the number of people traveling on Mondays and Tuesdays and looking for workation experiences. So we can't accurately predict what the post-pandemic consumer will do, how they'll behave. There's nobody in the world who can do that. We can only make scenarios and try to establish which way things will go. But we can see that certain aspects will stick. For example, during the lockdown period, certain very crazy ideas emerged, such as remote experiences. And I guess the question I would have, and I would love someone to say yes, is did you pay five pounds for a call with this goat? A lot of people did. In fact, this was just one little gem of an idea which started to trend. And people used the goat to create announcements such as the birth of a baby or a will you marry me message. Well, whilst this kind of thing can seem very silly and maybe not relevant now, in fact, this is a great example of creating engagement, but creating connections with real experiences. And if you're smart, you can leverage the opportunity at a business level or a PR level, and both are really interesting. We've also seen ways in which we can augment everyday experiences. This is a restaurant in Pimlico in London that for Chinese New Year teamed up with an artist to create an AR experience with a wrap around the outside of the restaurant. A really great way of bringing it to life and creating an entirely new experience. And that was something that was sponsored as well. So it didn't cost the restaurant anything. Here's an example of an app called Secret City Trails that allows you to create a gamified experience around uh, a destination, for example, in this case, Porto. And it's a great example of how we're also familiar now with scanning QR codes and interacting with content online. Can we take that one step further and create an interactive and playful experience around the destination or around the business? And speaking of participatory experiences, this is one of my most recent and favorite examples. It's an audio experience that uses audio and light to light up uh, an installation across a zebra crossing. This is just happening right now in Eindhoven in the Netherlands, and it's part of the GLOW Festival. And they've used a lot of very impressive technology to read and to use cameras to read the actions and combine that with uh, some really interesting sound technology, which the stripes identify. You see this creates incredible ex um, digital engagement online because people share that experience. I've seen many videos, including children just screaming and running across backwards and forwards across the zebra crossing to try and make the levels go up and down. I'm assuming they closed the road for that though. And then lastly, finding your forever home. Well, this is what we all want. We want to establish a business that's resilient, that's strong, and that has a long-term and viable future. And in particular, coming out of a pandemic, we're looking for a bit of stability. Well, if commitment is on the cards, then we need to know where it's headed. And at the moment, the forecasts for the planet, and we've all been following COP26, are pretty bad. But maybe, just maybe, we can commit to doing something about it. By becoming more sustainable, and of course, this is the topic of the next webinar, so hopefully that's a plug for that, we can use the power of digital. We can use that to create a tribe of empowered citizens and purpose-driven guests, because guess what? Whilst the last 20 years, competitiveness has been defined by our ability to differentiate ourselves and to have a strong digital presence, the next 20 years will be determined by our sense of purpose and our responsibility when it comes to sustainability. Guests will increasingly choose businesses that show commitments to that and tell the story of their transformation. And if you can combine these two, you have the magic mix. The last few examples, this business very close to us in Margate and Kent 
is creating a real sense of place. They aren't just a business that sources material from the sea. They're a business which is deeply passionate about protecting the ocean. They're, they're part of 1% for the planet, an initiative which is very important for them to get behind. And they tell a story about regeneration in this local area, about the importance of community and the role that they see themselves playing in that. They're a very relevant social voice on topics such as at the COP26 climate summit. And they don't shy away from having a voice and an opinion on these things, which is perhaps a different stance than we maybe are used to, where we think politics and brands shouldn't go together. We see this great business um, called Silo in London, which is creating a sense of purpose by completely radically reinventing what it means to be a restaurant. And they created the first zero waste restaurant. But of course they can't be successful in that if they don't leverage the potential of things like crowdfunding on social and the ability to tell their story and talk about the process change that they've put in place. We're all familiar probably with the beer company Brewdog. They create a sense of empowerment with their customers. This is a business which has pitched itself completely differently for the millennial era. Their competitive values are about commercial activism and they wear their values on their sleeve or in this case on their website, stated transparently and clearly. They have beers which are crowdfunded and they also have forests which are crowdsourced through the planting of trees against the purchase of a beer. And they have a sustainable impact report, which is incredibly transparent and detailed, which shows about the processes behind their business. Transformation is not something we can do overnight and brands are starting to move in that direction. At the bottom is an example of Mud Jeans. If you never heard of them, check them out. They're a textile company which has entirely reinvented itself based on ethical textile industry. And they even have really innovative ideas like leasing jeans so you don't continue to repurchase jeans, but you actually recycle them. And then even companies like EasyJet, which have a much more challenging job, are making progress towards changing processes in their supply chain. In this case, sourcing uniforms out of plastic bottles and talking about the story behind that. They're bringing many elements together the importance of data to tell the progress of their story, but also the importance of being able to use content to tell it in a really rich and engaging way. Well, it's easy to make commitments and it's really, really important we don't greenwash. So this is a message I hope you'll take away. Recently in the news, there was a lot of talk about this plant a tree co, which said for every pet picture, we'll plant a tree. And then they had to post this. We posted it, but only for 10 minutes. We immediately understood its potential. This post had and believed we didn't have the cap capabilities or resources uh, to keep their promise. So they deleted it. And basically they're talking about how impactful that was. The key message is do not commit or make statements that you can't stand behind. It's important that your message is authentic. And digital once again allows you to do that in a very clear and transparent way, which will be part of your competitive edge. I think this is my last example is Soneva. Soneva is very committed to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. They're B certified, which means they measure and they demonstrate their commitment at multiple levels, such as community, such as sustainability and environmental. And they also have a sustainability report where they measure every single metric on the impact behind their business. This is the last section, and I will promise I will wrap up within the 30 minutes. So a bun in the oven. We're at the last part of this journey. If you're a tourism business, which has mastered the art of digital, then maybe there's a new opportunity on the horizon. Why not try your hand at becoming a digital business and mastering the art of tourism? Disruption is something we need to be aware of. Digital is full of it, and many of us will have experienced that firsthand. We only need to look at Airbnb to understand what uh, disruptive waves that sent through the industry. But who says we can't be the ones to disrupt, the ones to give birth to new ideas? This is key to being competitive. And the key thing here is to apply the principles of innovation within your business. We can test concepts. This is one I've been talking about for a long time. And it was only when preparing this, I realized it was actually in Northern Ireland. So that was great to see. It's an example of a horse box, which has been recycled and repurposed to, uh, it's called the Oatbox. And um, it's a great example of a new kind of accommodation experience, 
where perhaps your guests don't necessarily choose Northern Ireland, they choose the oak box because it's so original, and then they discover everything else around it. This is a business called Unyoked, which has created experiences in very random places, and it allows you to browse based on the kind of experience you want to have, not the hotel room that you perhaps imagine you want to have. And this is about pivoting our thought on what people are even looking for. The uh, company Dishfatch was born out of the pandemic, and they allowed all the Michelin star reps, uh, restaurants and top chefs to sell their cook at home dishes online. And now this is a roaring success, which has continued and grown after the pandemic. And thinking about digital commerciality, there are opportunities to identify new revenue streams that we perhaps saw during the pandemic, but we can put in place for the long term. This is an example of subscription-based businesses such as Cuvée Privé or the Natural Wine Subscription, who have managed to turn visitors into subscribing customers. Or this example of a tour operator that pulled together all its competitors, competitors and created a digital gift box business around experiences. And my very last example is also one very close to home in Canterbury. It's about digital loyalty. This is Simpsons Wine. It's a very 360 business that has every touch point right in digital. They have a loyalty club, 500 a year. It's a little bit expensive for me. They have gift cards, a great way of creating redemption in a very simple and easy way. And they have a whole range of really unique experiences, including intimate sessions with a chef where you can learn about pairing wines and all sorts of other great things. There is no magic behind this. It's a holistic, a 360 and a consistent approach. And it's making sure that you set all of your ducks in place and you get your priorities right. On that note, I want to say thank you. I will now stop the screen share and I will hand back to Joe. My goodness, my head's buzzing. I don't know about anyone else. I'm still trying to get my head around that uh, zebra crossing. Amazing, just amazing innovation there. Um, we had a question in, um, Nick, from our chat room. Huge attractions have huge budgets. You know, what's the marketing strategy for local tourism or smaller villages? Is the cost of marketing the main obstacle? Does digital have to be expensive? Do we need to wheel in loads of equipment and loads of experts? I'm so glad you asked that. And that's why I started with so many social things. Um, Social is not my thing, so to speak. There are many, many social gurus out there. But I think I do recognize that social is probably the first place we look as a business in terms of how we might engage or reach new audiences. Those examples I shared are creative examples. They're playful, they're experimental. We can, and there's a certain room for experimentation in that social space to see what works and to try out new ideas. Not everything will be a success, but we shouldn't be afraid of, of trying and learning. And there are many great ways that we can use our smartphone to create these shortcut clip videos. In fact, um, companies like Apple provide free training all the time and sometimes very hands-on. So you can even take a business idea to them and they'll show you how to create that video. So there are ways to do this. And I think um, it's important that you know, any small business doesn't feel overwhelmed, daunted, or just you know, uh, hopeless in this space of exciting new things. Things like the light festival in Eindhoven with the zebra crossing, they are high budget and ex uh, expensive. And these are things which you know, most of us would struggle to put in place. But things like the AR example of Smartify or the example of Secret City Trails and the playful discovery, these are opportunities for you as a business to perhaps try and think a little bit creatively about some of the really cool apps that could create interactions around your business. You might use something that's off the shelf, but tie it in with an experience and tell your visitors, well, when you come and stay with us, why not try this? We built our own discovery through a third party app. And there are many ways you can think about how to leverage that. Even some of the content creation things, you know, working with podcasts, for example, you can set that up yourself and you can create a regular series. Perhaps once every month or once every two months, you create a really interesting uh, podcast. So I think the key thing is not to try and go over the kind of uh, horizon technology um, things, which are really exciting, but make sure you get uh, all the basics right first. And once yeah. you've got that right, start to try and experiment with new formats, see what you can do, 
share ideas with others and also reach out to other businesses, maybe businesses which are a little bit bigger or doing it in a way that really impresses you and invite them, you know, ask them if they want to share a little bit about how they've done that. Maybe invite them for a free night or a free dinner, uh, whatever it is that you can use as leverage, because actually yeah. you'll find that people are very open and willing to share. And sometimes, you know, someone sharing something can just be so beneficial, but don't be scared and don't hold back. And, and it seems, you know, keep it simple as well. Don't, don't overcomplicate yeah, things. Exactly. I think we're really spoiled here. You picked up on it. We've got so many uh, sites and locations and augmenting these, you know, seems like a, a, a brilliant idea, a brilliant area to explore. Do you, I mean, is that really difficult to do? There are many ways you can do that. And I encourage creativity um, when you can't always see the cheap option. QR codes, for example. Anybody can now produce a QR code. Um, if, if you don't know how, ask someone at TNI, they'll, they'll definitely show you. Um, yeah. And anyone can create some sort of digital content. It might even be just a video that you can play. Now, if you can put that QR code on a table, for example, or on a menu, and your guests can scan that. And then when the guests scan it, they watch a video of the farmer explaining the process behind that. You've created an entirely uh, new augmented experience with very basic um, and readily available technology. We all know how to print and produce you know, a menu in a well, Most restaurants will know how to do that in a, in a uh, restaurant. Many of us will feel confident we can at least shoot a simple video um, and you know, figuring out how to put that online, get a link to it, and then link that QR code to that, that's all you need. And it's a great way to then just create additional layers on the, the actual experience in, in the business. There are obviously lots of other opportunities. There's apps which allow you to create digital queues that allow you to have people order in restaurants and things like that. Um, and there are many other ways to do it. For example, you can create a, a trail of uh, different places in Google Maps and you can offer that to your guests. Um, so most of this is actually very accessible. It's, it's about your choices, what you decide to focus on, what story you tell or what trail or discovery you create around the business and then how you put it together and how you bring it to people. I think the key thing is to step back a little bit and just think it through. What would I do? What would I like to do if I were a visitor? And something I really wanted to cover in this, but I couldn't fit everything is uh, yeah. digital design. Um, if you have some time, learn a bit about design thinking because it's such a valuable uh, method to involve other people in the process. So one of the key opportunities is to involve your customers in the process. Maybe you have very loyal customers that you know quite well or people who return every year. Why don't you look at different ideas that you feel you could approach, but also sit down with them and explore how that would enrich their experience. Build a relationship. Don't feel that you always need to have this barrier between yourself as a business and your customers because they are the best ones to tell you what would make that an incredible and memorable experience. I think we could talk all day on this subject. Uh, it's just endless. As a very brief final point, something that occurred to me, do DMOs need to invest in new roles? Think about recruitment to kind of capitalize on digital. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, well, briefly, one of the briefly. skill sets, which is great. <laughs> yeah, you, you really raised the bar there. So uh, wow. one of the skill sets, um, which, which will be very important is data. Um, data for so many reasons, you know, on the one hand, the ability to create really smart applications, you know, for example, leveraging personalization, automation, AI, I mean, there are so many things you could do there. Um, so having good, really strong skills around data will allow you to do that, but also for the same reason, skills around data will help you navigate the next 10 years of sustainability, because one of the things we're missing across the entire industry is really good granular measurements. We're doing, you know, some of it's measured, but yeah. it all needs to be measured. And that means we need to know in one city or in one destination, what the impact of the entire restaurant sector is and what the in, uh, footprint of our tourists are. And frankly, nobody can say that. So these are, this skill set around data will be very, very valuable. And if anyone's um, having, you know, has kids growing up right now, I think, um, send them on in that direction they'll probably make a lot of money because there's not enough ah. people with 
those skills. <laughs> yeah, that's helpful. That's helpful. Okay, listen, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much for your time today. Good luck in Seville. It's been great hearing uh, what, what you've uh, had to say today, Nick. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, moving on, uh, our next contributor is David Maxwell of Further Space. A uh, driven uh, entrepreneur, he's successfully developed multiple startups. Uh, he's got 24 years of experience, uh, including four startup enterprises in telecoms, bespoke timber framing, uh, timber framing housing rather, pod manufacturing, and most recently, further space. So his experience spans all aspects of entrepreneurism and leadership, including sales and marketing, technical application, financial management, and customer service. So over to you. And he's uh, actually in Birmingham at the NEC there today. Over to you, David. Hi, Joe. There he is. There he is. Further space. We're by the sea. We're in the mountains. We're on the lawn. We're on the lawn. And nestled and in scenic farmland. We're comfy we're beds comfy and beds warm showers, and, and we're ready to welcome you. Book your amazing book glamping amazing getaway, getaway now getaway at further.space. Further oh, you've wet our appetite there, David. Tell us some more. Well, thanks for the opportunity um, to, to talk today. Um, for, further Space effectively invests in microtourism businesses uh, across the UK and Ireland, and we look for inspiring rural entrepreneurs um, this allows us to facilitate four-star accommodation experiences um, that sustains and complements landowners and rural economies. Um, Barry, if you can maybe take, take the next video for me, please. So we have taken quite a, a innovative approach um, kind of utilizing virtual reality and augmented reality um, virtual reality allows us to engage with with potential landowners and actually give them the opportunity to experience a fully immersive pod um, short of being in the actual pod where we manufacture them in Belfast um, this allows us then to kind of put the pod into context show the landowner the the, the size how we use the space and some of the key features like the, the, the Murphy bed, the, the, the ensuite bathroom, fully plumbed toilet, um, and just puts those features, features into context. Uh, we, we teamed up with Sugar Rush Creative in Belfast. We take, we take our VR headset um, to various locations across the country. Uh, the landowner is able to put this on and it transports themselves pretty much into a, a, virtual, a virtual pod where they can walk around the pod and, and get an idea of what it's all about. Um, the next stage then for us really was was then, I mean, how, how do we how do we take our pod then um, when we're talking to potential landowners? I mean, our business is all about kind of putting boutique accommodation in places where you would never get bricks and mortar buildings. <laughs> so we have, Which I'm sure brings us challenges to you. <laughs> It absolutely does, Joe. Um, you mean with 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 projects in in Glenarm Estate, um, Bally Castle, uh, the Moor Mountains, County Fermanagh, and next year we're rolling out projects in the Old Head of Kinsale, the Ring of Kerry, Belmullet, Wexford, the Isle of Skye, and Dartmoor in England. So, um, it's not feasible for us to bring the physical pod. The pod weighs two and a half tons. It's uh, mm. It's an escort of load when you're taking it down the road. So the next stage for us is, is whilst the, the VR will give the landowner that immersive element, what we then need to do is be able to visualize what these pods look like in certain parts um, of the country. And that's where augmented reality comes in. So Barry, if you don't mind maybe hitting the next video for me. So what we've got here is basically um, a colleague of mine with an iPad and he, what he does is he places the, the pod on a scale of one to one and um, and we can we can superimpose that in an actual site where we plan to put the pods and we can multiply that up. We're only using this as a single pod example. Then using your iPad, um, you're then able to walk into the pod again um, 
look at how we've used the space, some of the quirky features, a bit of a, a flavor on the quality and aspects of the pod. Um, but as, as Ali walks into the toilet and then comes back out again, you'll be able to see how the augmented reality works in real life. We'll just give it a wee second here. So you can see that's his offices there. Um, great tool, great way of visualizing things. And, and, and what it does is it just helps us put into context the opportunity for the landowner. I mean, we're asking our landowners to invest heavily into this, as do we. And um, we have to give our landowners all of the information that they need to make an informed decision. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a really exciting time for us. Um, and in Birmingham at the minute, we've just launched into England yesterday. Um, it's a pretty buzzing, buzzing show for us, Look as you can that. see. Hey. And uh, yeah, you mean talking. just trying to trying to leverage technology. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I was I was freaking out a bit earlier on there because a lot of background noise, but uh, the technology is holding up. Yeah. Let me ask you this, David. Like, what can others learn from your experience, from your journey? Well, I mean, <laughs> we've come from humble beginnings. You mean we've. we've Peter and myself have bootstrapped the business for three or four years. Um, I mean, over that time, we've, we've, we've had a vision. And I guess, I mean, as we work through all of those proof points and then generate the resources then to be able to leverage kind of innovative technologies, I mean, it's, it's about being patient. It's about listening to your customers. I mean, Further Space as a brand was born out of a research study. So we suppressed their bias and we asked their demographics. And they have really informed all aspects of the business. The pod, our digital um, campaign, the likes of the tools that we use. And you mean, our, our landowners range from kind of commercially uh, acute individuals to, to farmers who just want to diversify their land. Um, and all of these tools, as an, as an individual tool, they don't really work that well, but as a collection of tools and the way that we present them, um, we're able to get, we're able to inspire and we're able to at least allow our landowners to visualize what we're able to bring to the table. So when they actually see the pod in real life, you mean the penny drop, if, if, if you know what I mean. So it's a, it's, it's a collection of tools and it's, it's, it's um, constantly evolving and, 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 and you know, it's, it's, it blows my mind. I mean, we're, we're even today, mind. you mean. You know, I'm I'm sitting here thinking about our fathers and forefathers and what they'd have made of you know pods in their in the middle of their their, their farmland. It's quite something, isn't it? What what were the main challenges that you faced? Well, I mean, the challenges for us is that I mean we're not a sales organisation, so I mean we're investing in microtourism businesses, and that has a direct impact to rural economies, both for the landowner and for the the local. The locale around it and um, yeah. we're a very innovative business there's not a lot of business there's no businesses actually do that, what we do so it's mm. almost sounds too good to be true so i guess when when we're entering into 10 20 relationships with landowners i mean our business is not about pods it's not about filling those pods with, with people it's actually about those 100 relationships that we create over the next five or six years so i mean we're an open book and we have to use our, I mean, our team, our digital assets. I mean, VR and augmented reality has really helped us, but we're only scratching the surface. Yeah, we really are. So it's 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 a, it's a tool, it's a tool as a range of tools that just help us create um, integrity and 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 comfort. And uh, when we're asking our partners to invest together with us to create great experiences for people around the country. It's a steep learning curve, as you say, and it does sound like you're only scratching the surface. Uh, again, you know, the, the sky's the limit. And thank you so much for joining us today, particularly from uh, from Birmingham. Good luck with the rest of the show. No problem. Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. OK, moving on to our next contributor today. Uh, he's an anthropology and Celtic archaeology graduate. He spent many years working in the events industry and back in 2013, was looking for a fresh challenge. So he set up DC. Uh, he wanted to create a walking tour with a completely fresh approach and a deliberately independent look and feel. Mark, are you there? Can I see you? There he is. Hi, Joe. How are you? Mark, I, I just wanted to start. Could you give us a snapshot 
of, of your business pre-COVID? Just a very brief kind of background. Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, we set up DC Tours in 2013, as you say. And at the start, uh, it was just it was a part time hobby. We just wanted to uh, create an experience, uh, give people the opportunity primarily then to learn about the troubles from an entirely neutral and unbiased um, point of view. Yeah. And we aspired and we hoped that it would go full time. Um, you know, it would, we would make a real career out of it. But um, at the start, we were we were pretty happy just running as a a, a part time hobby. And back then, it was really simple. You know, we we set up a three page website, we listed ourselves on TripAdvisor, and we we concentrated on delivering tours and just getting really you know five star reviews as much as we could. And people yeah. came to us through through that uh, that channel. But by so fairly low tech. sorry, fairly low tech very low tech a lot of fun but very very low tech no digitalization at all really um but by 2017 we could see that there was a real change in uh behaviors and tourists and there was a rise in online travel agents um and we could see more people were researching before they traveled and we we had a simple booking system in uh but it wasn't specific to the industry and we we were approached in 2017 by one of the tourist attraction booking engines, and we uh, we joined with them, and no setup fees. You know, they they take a percentage of ticket sales, uh, and it fully integrated into our website, made the whole visitor journey really simple. But not only that, it it uh, it gave us a dashboard, a really amazing suite of data of information was coming to us. But the big thing was that it integrated with every other online travel agent, so it meant that all our administration was massively reduced and we were selling across all platforms via tour, get your guide, amusement, Expedia. And that was a real game changer um, because at the same time, we knew more and more visitors were uh, researching in advance and booking in advance. And therefore we were right in front of them, you know, no matter where they were in the world. Yeah. 20, 20, 2017, 2018, we doubled, we, we made the commitment, we went full time 2018. We doubled our turnover in that year. So things um, are going really well. Yep. Boom, March 2019, that all changed. COVID things were going, first lockdown. What, what was like that like for you? What did you do then? Things were going fantastic. Yeah, 20, the whole 2019 was was amazing. Um, we were winning awards. We actually, we, we took some time and we had our first foray into augmented reality. We, um, we went in as consultants with a local AR company to create um, an app that allowed people to uh, see and discover ancient sites with uh, augmented reality, see how they used to look. Um, however, yeah, the one thing I learned a lot of respect for tech at that point because how hard it is to create something entirely new and fresh. So we stepped back, we concentrated, and we were going 2020 is gonna be our year. You know, We were just going, this is gonna be amazing. And then obviously the pandemic hit and we stepped back and we reviewed everything and we thought, OK, visitor behaviours are going to change again. And at that point, we knew that, you know, lockdowns meant that there was going to be no live in-person tours for some time. And we were bringing in a lot of information, uh, digital information by signing up to tourism newsletters from across the world. Um, like the likes of uh, Team Zola, ResD, Peak Pro, Fair Harbor, all these different resources were just packaging up tourism trends and aspirations and potential ideas for the future. And we were getting this just straight into our inbox. And we looked at what was happening and we saw the line, the, the rise of the remote or the online tours. So we thought, okay, we will make uh, an online experience, as we called it, which was basically a glorified webinar. You know, it was. But it was still the opportunity for anybody, no matter where they were in the world, um, to, to log on, um, interact with us and our guides one-to-one, -one, ask us questions about our lives, ask us questions about our history. And that, that kept us engaged and going. And we were working with universities from Holland to Texas, you know, but we do kind of see that as a fad. So while that was keeping us going, that's whenever we we then decided to move into self-guided audio tours. 
and self-guided audio tours they're by no means new but the platforms have massively improved so you do have um, the ability to download we our brand was very important to us so we did a lot of research and you can uh, echoing what the guys were saying earlier you can absolutely make these for practically nothing you know um, and somebody in with their pent up frustration and wanting to travel they can download the tour anywhere in the world and take the tour while they're sitting at home or they can use it on location in the city they can go around and see different things um, and we have created a suite of nine different um, self-guided tours everything from uh, West Belfast to um, the Titanic Quarter to a line of duty uh, yeah. location tour. And we can it's even... It's all happening during lockdown and this is you thinking out of the box, you're, 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 you're kind of trying to scramble your thoughts together and survive essentially. Yeah, absolutely. We did, a, I must admit, there's a huge amount of research because everything out there is platform based. You know, there are, rather than making it ourselves again, we, we did a huge amount of research and we could find that some some companies were offering, you can create one in a day practically and have it live tomorrow. Um, others give you a lot more control and are a lot more friendly and easier to, to use. Um, but it kept us and our guides engaged. And very quickly it turned out that, and we, we created them specifically that they were not competing with our live in-person tours, they were complementing them. But soon our self-guided tours were proven to be the, the third most popular page on our website. Mm -hmm. And at the whole start of the process, at the, the whole start of 2021, we were looking at tourism trends and people were saying, if we can achieve 60% of uh, tourism numbers of 2019 and 2021, we'd be doing well. And we did start off in 50 and 60% in June, July, August. And we've just closed out October at 90, 96% of wow. October 19, and we're on track to do the exact same this November. So, yeah. so what were the big game changers? How have you managed to turn it around and, and get back to, you know, high 90s? I suppose um, we have also, we have never been digital experts and we have never been marketing experts. Um, but another thing that we did do was we have devote a lot of time to really trying to train our brains to understand Google Analytics um, and the, the digital analysis of you know where our marketing is going, uh, where we're advertising, um, how we target uh, potential visitors, guests, or people who are interested. Um, and, and as you know, going back to the very basics again, our you know we did rebuild our website and concentrated on SEO. Um, and again, that was all with help and support. You know, um, we started off trying to be low tech Joe, and suddenly we're we're being cast into sitting in front of a computer eight hours a day. Um, we did get a lot of support. Uh, we leveraged programs run by Tourism NI uh, consistently right. over the last uh, eighteen months. Um, so I can't really pin it down to one thing, but yeah. staying aware of everything that is happening around us um, and just being magpies, you know, going out and just picking up bits of information, thinking of what might work for us mm. um, and then giving it a go. Um, you don't we, need to be a complete tech head is the message really for people watching today. Absolutely. The platforms are amazing now. They are, you know, for self-guided tours, I had never heard of Zoom, you know, and then one month later, we're, we're you know, presenting yeah. packages. Yeah. I think um, we were all in that front. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. But yeah, I must admit for the, the ease with which we can create. And I suppose we, we stayed with a mantra of having a bias towards action. You know, we were just, yeah. we had to get out and create. And then we were also... Um, we were also looking at it from a point of view that perfect is the enemy of good. You know, we were just going out and making something and seeing if it worked and then making it better as we went along. And yeah, we didn't we stand still. No, um, I suppose we just feel like we've been rewarded by that. You know, um, we do have next stages to go. You know, social media, we are not experts on. We have created videos, but it, we're on a journey, I suppose. Um, all I can say is that we you know i there are some things i absolutely have a 
fear of, or sometimes you get a little bit too uh, caught up in the, the minute of data and details, and sometimes you need to ask for help. Um, mm -hmm. But for us, the help was there, you know, and I think if anybody asks, you will they will find that the help is there, and that's that's really, really cool. I, I, basically, we have felt very supported by, by the industry, um, and I think it's reflected in how how we feel that the company's going. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you've seen a lot of changes in terms of consumer behavior, I'm guessing, as well. Yeah, um, it was a, it was a, how many times have I or have we said game changer today, you know? Um, <laughs> we consistently see it, and I think that what is happening in 20 and 2021 are not indicative, you know, maybe of what's gonna happen next year, the year after, I think. But the joy of digital is that, um, it can be implemented quite uh, cost effectively. And if something doesn't work, yeah. it can also be taken away quite quite simply as well. And you just concentrate on, on what you enjoy and yeah. what's delivering results. And it, and it certainly is delivering results by the signs of it. We're, we're really happy, you know, um, you know, we went from just myself and my colleague, Paul, um, eight years ago, we now have a handful of guides um, yeah. We're looking to bring it in more for 2022, and yeah, you know, our our books are filling up. So, so to summarise, you know, could you top three tips for for people listening today? Top three tips all day long. I would say um, sign up for as many of the the other joy of the virtual uh, situ life that we're living at right now is that so many things that previously cost money, like going to an expo or a workshop across the world. There's so many more hybrid events and lots of them are being delivered for free that if you look, you will find uh, opportunities to um, attend or hear from absolute thought leaders, you know, the likes of uh, Nick. Um, so that would be that would be the one, just expose yourself to the global trends and the tourism trends. Um, and then just embrace embrace opportunities you know positive this sounds terrible and corny positive mental attitude um there you, go. you know but the the idea that you know it's not that if, if something doesn't work it's not a failure it's just that the next time you try it you're going to be starting with experience um rather than from a, a standpoint again and for us really collaboration you know um my final tip would always be go with a platform provider or go with uh, a partner who does not use robots or AI for their customer service. Um, we work with we work with people who have real live human account managers, and you know we pay a premium for our platforms, the, the, our partners, um, but it means that if something does need fixed, then we get to speak to a human. Uh, whereas if we talk to a, a, a bot or AI, it's it's terrible. So that yeah, uh, yeah working with quality providers, yeah, do your homework all day long. That's that's my tip. Lovely, lovely place to end on. Thank you so much for uh, for taking the time to to join us today. Um, and I'm I'm hearing kind of hot off the press that uh, next next event has been cancelled. I think Nick can can rejoin us, which is a great thing. Can I just point out any questions? Please do put them in the chat panel. Um, I'll keep asking away, but if there are any burning questions out there, uh, do please let me know. Uh, so, can we go back to Nick? Can we go back to Nick? Hello. Oh, I I am back. I am speaking at a yeah no worries I'm speaking on another stage in, in a minute but I, so I was kicked out of the very quiet room so I do apologize for the background sound okay we we live with that just keep chatting to us we're, we're we're waiting for some questions to come in um you know to keep it simple if you had two big takeaways from today what would they be uh, I think what's really clear um, from from the examples I showed, but also uh, the examples we heard from, is that you know you don't need to be daunted by digital. Um, do not allow it to scare you. Uh, be excited by all the developments that we can see happening around us. Be excited by these great AR examples and how that can 
reimagine and bring things to life. You know, if you're a landowner or you're a hotel with a lot of land around it, these only help you to see things in a different way. Um, and as I think we heard just in the last part there, the, you know, we have to, you only learn when you make mistakes. So I think this is really, um, it's important to try and um, to, to not be afraid of making mistakes. And I think at a more of an institutional level, whether it's galleries, museums, local authorities, or in the tourist boards, to also promote a culture of openness, of collaboration, of uh, learning and testing and failing, um, and for that to be okay. I think, you know, we, we too often try to, you know, hold back until we can put a perfect message or a perfect image out, but that holds us back from maybe having more dialogue or an open conversation. I think if we talk about our intentions, where we're trying to go, the ideas that we have towards getting there, there's a lot more room than we probably imagine for acceptance that there will be some failings along, along the way. And I think as we look at sustainability and we look at the digital, um, the digital requirements that's going to be sitting there alongside sustainability, we will have no choice but to say this is where we want to go and this is what we're trying to do but we don't know if we will succeed at every step and i think you know if there's one takeaway this is what i would say to to businesses to to adopt this keep it real keep it real can i ask just a final personal question you know are, are the results there does digital really drive business forward um well yes and no, no i mean what's more important than anything is that you have a sense of purpose that you have a clear defined focus within your business um and that you can deliver that with a sense of clarity and simplicity for your customers but digital is part of your brand's home if you like it's where people will research it's where people will check out reviews that other people have left to validate your statements, um, which yeah. might not be true. Uh, it's where they will interrogate whether you're as, you know, your credentials are what they say they are. Um, and it's where they'll seek inspiration. And the customer journey can be quite protracted. And this is why digital is important because it's a fragmented journey. We might spark an interest one day, revisit that another, um, follow, uh, keep that in mind, and then see an offer that triggers that interest. Um, so it's a, it's a, that's why I told it as a relationship, or like a family relationship, because it's something that you build up um, and you build a deeper relationship. Uh, and that's everything there is what digital can do. Without that, you don't have a brand. That's what's key. And if you don't have a brand, you can still sell and you can still succeed but you depend on airbnb or booking.com to bring you all your customers and you have very little resilience or strength as a brand outside of that so this is about equipping you know digital is about equipping businesses to be in control of their own destiny perfect note to end on thank you so much indeed for your time today and thank you indeed to everyone for joining us on our webinar and uh, i look forward to the next one. Bye-bye for now.